449, just a few more pages there. Be the glory to God be the yes, glory. Sir. All right. To, to God, God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the Leaves me 
through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. brothers here has earplugs ready <laughs> just in case he, he has to hear me saying amen okay so this for this week's bible believing announcements guess what's happening tomorrow i know you guys are think i know you guys what you guys are thinking it's bible study yeah bible study 8 p.m hey for those of you who want to be discipled it's 7 p.m so you get to come an hour early yeah <laughs> praise the lord it's at uh pastor's place Ask him if you need the address. I'm not going to divulge it online. I'm sorry, guys. I know some of you guys want to visit Pastor, but I can't give it out to you. Amen. Next week, um, street preaching at 1030, same corner, same place. Uh, we're going to hopefully get some more Hail Satans, amen? It's going to be good. Yeah. It's going to be good. Uh, always a good time. Hey, so important news, brethren. We have Missionary Hansen coming on July 29th he's going to be speaking for us and on July 28th we have fellowship starting at 7 p.m. Um, and we're going to have brother Turner pastor's old PBI teacher coming and teaching us so it's a very big day for all of us if you can come I strongly encourage you to come and if there's anybody who knows of a place that we can use for the fellowship that is also it's all it's an urgent matter for us so please let us know um, I'm sure pastor would like us to use a bigger venue for for this fellowship and it's going to be a potluck so cook your own food bring your own food we're going to have a good time i mean you don't really have to cook you can buy food but the point is bring your own food <laughs> um <laughs> hey, my bread will be there amen <laughs> it'll be all leaven for jesus christ <laughs> our memory verse is going to be psalms chapter 8 verses 1 through 9 we're going to review that make sure we commit that to memory now we're going to have a congregation special leading on the everlasting arms and what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms.
If Brother Robert can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us, and then ask God's blessing upon the offering with a word of prayer as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come to come before you, Lord God. Uh, we ask that you'll um, fill this room with your grace, Lord God, that we all may give cheerfully, Lord Amen. Jesus. I uh, pray that you bless this offering, Lord God, that it may bring uh, not only glory to your name, Lord God, but may uh, answer the prayers of the church, Lord God. Yes. I know we have a lot of things that we need to do to um, expand and bring more glory to your name and bring uh, more souls to you, Lord God, to your, to your everlasting arms, Lord God. Um, please just bless this, this offering, Lord Jesus, and all this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 17, please. Exodus chapter 17, and we will read verse 1. Exodus chapter 17, and we will read verse 1 through 7. <coughs> Exodus chapter 17, and we will read verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7. In this passage, the children of Israel... They are tired of wandering in the wilderness, even though they didn't go that far. And then they all of a sudden start whining, despite of God giving them, making them win against the, one of the most powerful nations at that time, Egypt. Despite of God giving them the win, where he was able to drown all the Egyptian soldiers in the Red Sea. Despite of the win, where God just gave them bread from heaven that time. And he also gave them meat in their stomachs with all the quails coming in. Despite of God giving them the wind where he provided them water to drink, they immediately forgot about it. They ignored it, rejected it, and they started whining. Look at Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore, do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? It is very easy to put ourselves in the children of Israel's shoe before we judge them too harshly where God has given us Victory after victory. You've seen how God made you win in this particular trial, in this particular temptation. And God made you win the victory over impossible situations in your life. And it is amazing that even though we are on the winning side, we go to the whining side. We whine about our victories. We whine about our winnings. It's a winning. It's a victory. It's a success. It's a blessing. It's a joy. And you turn it into something that's negative, you turn it into something that's dark, and you whine about it. That is something that is really wrong with Bible-believing Christians today. Every saved child of God is on the winning side. God has given you the victory. Right. Jesus died on the cross and paid salvation in full. He got the keys from death and hell. He resurrected out of the grave. Grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. Hell couldn't keep him in. All he could do is just three days, and Jesus Christ ascended up into glory. 
We are on the winning side and you are not living in victory. Instead, you drop your trophies and pretend that you're losing and you're whining about it. My title is finish whining and start winning. Let's pray. God, my Father, wash away my sins with your precious, most holy blood. And please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for each and every person that came to church today, and I really mean that, Lord. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll please bless them for coming, and that through this message you'll be a blessing to them. God, they need to hear from heaven and not from earth. They need to hear from God Almighty, not from dirt. Right, Heavenly Father, may you get the glory and may the preaching touch and change people's lives because, God, you deserve worship and proper service. So we need this preaching to change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is desolation in the wilderness. Desolation in the wilderness. That's my first point. Look at verse 1, please. Look at verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from, notice, journeyed from where? The wilderness of, I like the word right there, sin. Sin. After their journeys, according to the commandments of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. I don't know why that word was there in our King James Bible, but I can definitely see a devotional application right here where people start whining when they come from desolation in sin. So, you know one thing I learned about people is why do they keep whining? It makes me suspicious because you've been in desolation and sin. You know why whining happens and occurs? You've been messing around with something. When you're living in sin, you've got to understand that's the reason why you start to have negative thoughts and negative emotions because of the repercussions of the sin that you're living in. And while you're living in sin, do you honestly think there is peace and joy? You deceived yourself into thinking that because you still mess around in those things, it would give you the pleasure and it's only fun and games and God understands and you know, you don't have to be too formal, too strict about it. Well, if that's the case, then why are you whining about it? Shouldn't you be happy with those sins that you committed in your life? Why are you whining about your life? Because you're living in sin. And when you're living in sin, it does not give you true joy. And because you don't have true joy, that's why you're going to see negative things happening in your life. Negative thoughts stir up in your mind. Your, your flesh definitely does not feel joy because it's drained by sin. There is no pleasure in sin. That's the reason why you're whining. So it's always possible that you've got to look at your life and see, am I living in sin before you whine? Before you whine, am I living in sin? I mean, Jude chapter 1 and verse 16, you don't have to turn there, but this verse reads, these are murmurers, complainers. Why? Because it describes these murmurers and complainers as walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. See, you've got to understand that whining occurs because of the lusts of the flesh. From the lust of the flesh, that's where whining occurs. When you've yielded so much into sin, that means you've yielded so much into the lust of your flesh, right? It's no wonder that the repercussion of it and the result of it would be whining as a result. Because whining occurs because of the lust of the flesh. See, you got to realize this is that when you're serving God, positive emotions result with true joy... And you know that true peace, you don't worry about the sins and the things you're going through in life, contentment in your life where God puts you in, and not only that, faith. When you're reading your Bible and you're praying and you're soul winning and you attended every church service, don't you, didn't you feel like your faith getting stronger in the Lord? Didn't you feel like that there was a little bit more peace in your everyday situation in life? Because when you're not doing those things, what happens? When you fail to do those things, what kind of emotions stir up from sin? Guilt. Oh, I skip church again. I skip Bible reading again. What happens? Depression. Because you're not getting the true joy of the Lord because you've wasted your temporary joy on whatever your flesh desired. You get discontentment as a result. 
Because you, instead of remembering all the promises and blessings of God, if you are reading your Bible, if you are memorizing your verses, if you are praying, if you went soul winning, you became discontented and always found problem and problem and problem to whine about and to be worried about. Especially worrying. That's a negative emotion that results from sinning, right? Worrying. You can't, you don't feel at peace praying to the Lord to help you out with the problem now because you feel like that your sin is blocking your prayers. And that's the reason why, because of all these negative emotions all bottled up, obviously and eventually, if not now, whining will come out. Where you'll say, this Christian life is not for me. My heart is not in it. Why did God let this happen? Oh, bad things are happening to me. You wouldn't be saying all those things if all these negative emotions were not all bottled up to begin with. And these negative emotions happen because you are walking in your flesh, not walking in the spirit. If you were walking in the spirit, you would have had more peace, joy, contentment, and faith, faith, and faith, which would have shielded you from the attacks of the enemy. You know why you're whining? You've been messing around with something. So before you whine about a problem, don't make somebody suspicious. You must be sinning somewhere. So be, be careful, be careful what you whine about and you got to self-reflect and realize there's something I'm not doing right with God. Whining occurs when there is sin in the camp. And you notice the children of Israel, they came from that desolate desolation, that desolation from the wilderness of sin. And that's when they started whining. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, it reads, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You see, right here, God says that anyone who is saved and born of God, he's given you the victory. You're on the winning side, and you can overcome the world. You are a winner. You're not a loser. We live every day living in defeat Feeling like that we lose the battle every day we're about to drop, but you got to realize that you overcome the world. You are in victory. But the reason why, main reason why you keep whining and you keep whining and you keep living in sin and you never win. You just never win in your life. I realize this as I start to ponder more about the nature of man and look at the verses and pray a little more and search my own heart you know why you're not living your life winning don't you want to win don't you want to live every day winning in your life and instead of whining like a loser and feeling like you're losing every day do you know why you're whining and you feel like losing you don't want to win that's what i realized you're supposed to be a winner you're supposed to be winning but the reason why you feel like every day you're losing and you're whining about it is because you really don't want to win. You actually want the flesh to run over your body and whine and whine and whine whatever negative thing it's feeling and what you're thinking about. That's what you want. Deep down inside your heart, you don't want to win. You want to whine. That's why people whine. That's why you can't live in victory. You know why? You want to go by whatever this flesh wants to do. It wants to cry. It wants to be depressed. It wants to be miserable. Well, I don't want to be miserable. I don't want to be, cry. I don't want to be depressed. No, you actually do because you want this flesh to keep running its emotions and being tired and miserable and depressed and cry. And whatever it's stirring up inside, it just wants to yak it all out. Blah, blah this. Blah, blah that. Woe is me here. And this is the bad day. And blah, blah this. You want to be a loser. You don't want to be a winner. Deep down inside your heart, that's what you want to do. That's why you're still living in sin and you whine about it because you want to sin. You want to whine. You don't want to win the victory. You don't want to have the joy of the Lord. You don't want to have the peace of living in holiness. You don't want God to answer your prayers. You don't want God to richly bless you. You don't want the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You really don't want to deep down inside your heart. You want to lose it all and you just want to cry and whine and be depressed. That's what you want deep down inside your heart. You know why? That's how much desolation you are in that wilderness of sin. And you need to get out of there. Finish whining and start winning. Amen. My second point is drama in the wilderness. 
Drama in the wilderness. Oh, I love this part right here. Look at verses 3 through 4. <clears throat> you know what whining does? It makes you say, it makes you say exaggerated things. It makes you fantasize about exaggerated situations. Look at verse 3 through 4. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this? Now, is this a lie? Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Isn't that a lie? That is a lie. God gave them water to drink before. If you read a cha couple chapters behind, he provided them a miracle with water. Bunch of liars. Amen. They're exaggerating here. They're plainly lying here. But look at, now, look at verse 4. Moses starts to whine now. Now look at verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. He, they didn't mention that yet. It's like a pastor, when he loses a couple of members, then he's like, this is the end of our church, the end of our ministry. We're going to lose everything right here. Yeah. See, you know what whining does? It makes you be dramatic. It makes you be over-dramatize something, and then you start to fantasize and picture some monsters that actually don't exist, and you cause unnecessary burden to yourself. This verse is pretty odd verse for my point here, but... There's something to this verse that I want to say, so I'm going to quote it. Acts 25, verse 7, it says, And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. You know, one thing I learned about this is that when you're being dramatic and whining and create those fantasies, of unnecessary burdens when they actually don't exist you got to ask yourself this question after you whined about that problem let me ask you this question can you prove that existed can you prove it right in front of my face that actually happened can you prove it 100 percent? you can't can you you know why that's what whining does whining what it does it makes you feel it makes you picture some things bad things happening in your life oh i'm gonna die i'm gonna die well can you prove it you're alive you're breathing you're not dead see you can't prove you can't prove what you're whining about and that's why you know what you should do shut your mouth and then tell your tell your flesh you're a liar Amen. you're a liar for saying that you can't Amen. even prove what you're saying that's why I like that verse. Laid many grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. So you got to prove it. And until you prove it, you would calm yourself down, I think, after that. You would discipline your flesh after that. When you say, can you prove that happened? And then when you start to think and you really prove and you bet your soul on it, you, you bet your reward, your gold and silver at the judgment seat of Christ on it, then your worry and your whining will start to fade away after that. And you'll go, you know, I think I was just being too carried away right here. You know, the Lord, he'll take care of the situation and work it for good. You know, that's what's going to happen. You need to prove, you need to look at that flesh in the mirror, and you need to, say, you need to tell that rotten flesh of yours, prove what just happened. Prove it before the face of God at the judgment seat of Christ, and bet your gold and silver for that. Because I'm going to tell you one thing. You live daily betting your gold and silver, and it's just getting taken away, oh, taken away sure. every time yeah. you whine in the wickedness of your flesh. Yeah. Stop whining. Finish whining and start winning. Because you're a winner. You're on the winning side. Now, when you're being overtly dramatic, see, you're not being realistic about life. You're living in a fantasy. You know why? The reason why is because if you compared yourself with everybody else around the world, and maybe in your situation, you'd be surprised you're not the only one. And you'd be surprised how many people think it's normal to go through it. That helped me immensely in my life. I mean, it's so easy to tell yourself, oh, you're a pastor, so you have the roughest, and you have it rough than everybody. And that's so easy to think. Everyone has an excuse to think that they've 
got the justification for how hard their trial is, but all you have to do is compare yourself with other people, and then you'll realize that you're being unrealistic here. You got to realize it's normal for other pastors. It's normal for other missionaries. It's normal for other people in this room who are suffering, not just you. And you got to realize that when you're thinking like that, then you realize that, man, you're being pathetic, don't you think? You're actually just being overtly dramatic about the problems in life. How many people have health problems? How many people are struggling financially? How many people are still jobless? How many people are still having a hard time making a living? How many people are still having a hard time raising their children? How many people out there are still trying, uh, having a hard time raising the church? How many people out there are going through that and you think that you're the only one and you're, being over, you're dramatizing the situation oh. here? It's normal. It's normal. You got to realize. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. One thing that I liked about this verse, I can't believe I'm saying that I like this verse. I always said I hated this verse. But there's one thing I did like about that verse even though I didn't like that word terror, terror. That last line said it will be made manifest in our conscience. It's easy to whine because the fleshy emotions run through us and the flesh just wants to cry, wah, wah, and wah. That's what the flesh wants to do. So it's really hard to overcome such fleshy emotions. But then I realized there is one fleshy emotion which is a good thing that can override the fleshy emotions of whining. You know what it is? And this will shut your mouth and it helped me shut my mouth when I was going through a lot of stuff in work or in school and pastoring churches. You know what helped me immensely? It's shame. It's shame. You know why? Everyone, now don't lie to me, I know this, everyone has some sort of pride deep down inside their heart. People don't want to embarrass themselves. Nobody wants to look like the, the dumbest person in the whole room. Nobody wants to look like the idiot in the whole room. No one wants to look like the out of bounds in the in crowd. Nobody does. I don't care how young or how old you are. You don't want to look like the moron. But here's the thing, see. When you start to compare yourself with other people, and you start to, go ahead, whine about other people, about the problems you're going through in your life. Whine about, it all. whine about to as many people as you can. I guarantee you this, as you keep whining to a bunch of people, you're gonna bump across, sep you're gonna bump across many people who are gonna look at you funny and say, why are you being over dramatic about it? I'm going through the same thing like you. And then if you said that in a, let's say you did that in a room with 10 people and you start to whine about your problems, oh man, yeah, that, that part was hard, you know, and this was difficult and I'm going through this thing in my life. And those 10 people said, that's just natural. We all go through the same thing. Don't you think you're gonna shut up after that? No matter how much your flesh wants to whine, that fleshy emotion of embarrassment and shame will make you shut up. Right. You know why? Because shame and embarrassment is the strongest thing. You don't wanna look like the moron in the room. So start doing that. You know, that's why it, it helped me immensely as a pastor. What helped me immensely as a pastor before I shut off my mouth among other pastors, I tell myself this, you know, there's a fat chance all oh, those pastors and missionaries are going through the same thing. So I'm going to be quiet about it for now. See, that's going to shut up your flesh when it wants to whine is shame. Here's another thing. Another way that can help you is why don't you picture yourself at the judgment seat of Christ? Everyone's going to watch it, don't you know that? Everyone's going to watch you whining like a TV screen. And imagine how you embarrass yourself in front of millions and hundreds of thousands of Christians around the, the judgment seat of Christ. And as you keep watching that, you're going to put your hands over your face and you're going you're gonna to scream on top of your lungs as you see yourself whining on the screen. You say, just shut up and stop it, please. Will you shut up? Why are you embarrassing yourself? Just shut up. Stop the screen. Stop the screen. Just shut up. Why are you so stupid back then? And God's going to say, no, it has to keep playing. I have to judge every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. No wonder the Bible says terror, right? 
It's shame. Shame. No one wants to face shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Some of you think that you can get away at the judgment seat of Christ now after that? Some of you think, oh, you know, it'll be normal, it'll be fine. No, no, no. Shame. No one wants to make a fool of themselves. If you want the secret fleshy emotion to override the other fleshy problems of your flesh and whining, it's shame and embarrassment. That will help you immensely. My third point is drink in the wilderness. Drink in the wilderness. Look at verses 5 through 6, please. Verses 5 through 6. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel. And thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it, <coughs> that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now notice right here in verse 5 through 6, the children of Israel finally got their drink in the wilderness. And that should shut up any whining. To finish whining, what will shut up any whining is that you get yourself some water to drink. Instead of running your mouth, drown it out with the water of life. You need to drink up the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ in you so that you can shut your mouth a little more. Before you whine about a problem, why don't you sing a hymn? Before you whine about a problem, why don't you quote out a verse out of your mouth? Before you whine about a problem, why don't you tell somebody how to get saved? Before you whine about a problem, why don't you preach at yourself in the mirror? Before you whine about a problem, why don't you pray to the Lord for help? Before you whine about a problem, why don't you use your mouth to preach on the streets and tell people how to get saved? Amen. I think I would shut your mouth if you get some water to drink. Yes, sir. You need to be a winner because God has given you an unlimited amount of drink in that water of life. Jesus Christ said, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. I thank God for what Jesus Christ did. That rock pictured Jesus Christ. Moses, what he did was that he smote the rock so that water can come out of the rock and that shut up the whining mouths of the children of Israel. And that's what you need. You need that rock of Jesus Christ who poured out, gushed out water for you and you need to stoop down and shut up and repent on your knees and drink up that water on the altar and say, God, I repent. Let me drink up that water now. You need to repent and get right with God. Finish whining and start winning the, the battle that you are meant to do. Yes. All the souls that you want. All the prayers that you pull through. All the victories and the stories and the testimonies you can tell others on what God pulled you through. All the times that you walked with Jesus. Remember all the winnings that you've done. The blessings God has given to you spiritually and even physically that no one else has in this room. Start enjoying your victories now and finish whining. Finish whining and start winning. Finish whining and start winning. My Jesus, what he did at Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did it esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. You know what God the Father had the right to do? <clears throat> you think that you got it bad? You had it worse. You deserved hell fire for all eternity. You were lost in sin, broken and without hope and without God. And God had the right to take his rod and beat you with that rod of iron. But before God took that rod of iron and beat you senseless, Jesus Christ stepped in as the rock. And Jesus Christ said, smite me, Father. I will be stricken of God and afflicted. I will be wounded for his transgression, Amen. her inequity, the chastisement of all these people. Put it upon me. Beat me, Lord. And God the Father beat his son. And he beat his son. And he beat his son senseless. He beat his face that you could hardly, hardly look at his face as if it were a man. God beat his son so mercilessly that he had to turn his back on his son. And his son cried out and begged to the father, Why did you forsake me, father? You know why? The, the son took the beating in your case. He was a rock that was smitten for you. 
and that drink just poured out and flowed freely and ran down and all the souls of mankind started to rush down on that hill of Calvary, bend on their knees and drank up that blood of Jesus Christ as Jesus said, drink eat my flesh and drink my blood that you can have eternal life. And we drank up that blood of the Lord Jesus yes. Christ, not at a Catholic Eucharist, Amen. but at the cross of Calvary Amen. when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Jesus took the beating for you and he gave you such a rich drink. And yet you still whine about that drink that was so expensive that it costed the life of God's son. What in the world? What in the world are you whining about? You're such a winner. You got the victory over yeah. the devil and the gates of hell. Amen. You're Amen. such a winner. Right. No one, no, none of the principalities of this world, none of the top religious leader or the most powerful elites or the greatest right. demonic generals down below, they can't win against you right. because Jesus proclaimed the victory on the cross. Yes, so yes. act like a winner and keep drinking. Why, why do you whine? Why do you whine? Finish whining. You just got a couple laps out of that drink on the cross of Calvary, then you start to stray away and start to go down toward the pagan parts of the areas and start to whine and whine and whine and whine. Get out of there. Get out of there. Let me tell you something. Get out of that pagan dump. Get out of those streets and flee to the Calvary once more, will yes. you please? Amen. And stay there, please, will you? Will you please stay in your Bible Absolutely. reading? Stay in prayer. Stay on your knees. Stay in humility. Stay in the spiritual walk and the spiritual focus. Will you please stay at Calvary and keep drinking up that water of life? You know, celebrities, there's a good number where they might enjoy the benefits of their life. And they would try to enjoy them. And they would enjoy it. Now, you would think that some people, once they reach the celebrity, and they attain, and they won, finally, that status of fame and achievement, that they can start enjoying it. And there's a lot of actors and actresses that want to hit that winner's life. They don't care about bumping a few bumps that they would come across, like the media putting them in a negative light, how they would have to be careful about their image, about traveling and all the meetings they'd attend, because they take it as obvious and brush them off because they want that status. They want to enjoy the benefits of the celebrity life no matter what. Right? And they would start enjoying them and try to enjoy them, right? And they don't want to leave that lifestyle, right? Why? Because they like it that much. They love living that kind of celebrity life that they worked so hard to win and they finally got it. So any bumps that they would come across in winning that kind of life, they'll just brush it off and they don't care and they'd say, this is just normal, this is just realistic. And you got to realize that you're already higher than a celebrity status. Yeah. You're an ambassador and a representative of Jesus Christ. You are such a winner across the world. You are famous across the world. You're just not yet because you're afraid to knock on a door. You're just oh, not God. yet because you're afraid to mention Jesus That's so that it. you can look popular in the eyes of the world. You're just not that much of a celebrity yet because you're afraid to preach on the street. You're oh, not a celebrity yet because you're afraid to just hold a sign. Amen. You're That's you're good. not a celebrity yet because you don't want to be in part of a Bible-believing church Amen. that looks like that is already popular in the eyes of the world. You don't want to be like that. You, you will be popular. You will be a celebrity in your family. Trust me. Oh, yeah, that guy that loved Jesus. That guy that always prays before you. Oh, that guy that's the, the, the one guy out of the hundred who doesn't drink alcohol over there. That's, yeah, that's you, right. you are living the celebrity Amen. life, bless God. You already are. You already attain the fame and the popularity. You're already a winner. Winner. You're basking in the riches. You know what the riches are? Not paper green bills. It's gold, silver, and precious stones. You know what it is? It's not powerful elites funding and making keeping you up it's god almighty holding you up with an invisible hand that keeps up and keeps you going you know you got such a life that god has given to you you would think that with such a life that you would get that you would get that you finally won you finally won and some of you've been searching after many many years 
for something to win in your life, what must I do to be saved? Will someone give me Bible-believing truth? How long have you searched and you were losing here, losing there, losing this, losing that, and you finally won? And you finally won right here. And then you would think that with such a winner's life that you'd be living in, just like the celebrities, it's natural when the media puts you into a negative image. Okay. It's natural that people will try to find something wrong with you. It's natural you will come across some bumps in living a celebrity winner's life. You would think that that's just normal, that's natural, and you'd ignore them and you wouldn't care. Why? Because, man, I love the celebrity life. It's too good. I don't want to give up this fame. I don't want to give up this riches. I don't want to give up this possession. I don't want to give up this inheritance. I don't want to give up this blessing from God. That's why you would stop whining is because you would stop whining when you think this is the winner's life. It's natural you come across these bars. It's natural. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, would worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I would rec for I would reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which right. shall be revealed in us. Amen. Choosing, choosing rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but to suffer reproach with his people. You would think that's just natural in being a winner's life. Because how many Pharaoh's names do you know, but how many of you know the name of Moses? What a winner that guy was. He became a winner. How many Pharaoh's names do you know, but how many people know the name of Moses? You know why? Because that's how much of a status and power and fame and riches and blessing and great the life is and serving in God. So live in it and bask in it and enjoy it. Finish whining and start winning because you're a winner. It's natural. It's natural. Money runs out. It's natural. Health problems hit. It's natural that demons would get so jealous with what you've got that they start harassing you. It's natural that the world don't have the peace that you've got, so they start persecuting you. It's natural. You know why? They don't got the status. You do. Yes, sir. That's good. Now enjoy it and brush them off. Brush them off. You know, you, how many attacks do we get online? That's, I would hardly call that suffering and persecution. Right. I don't That's really good. whine about those yeah. things, actually. I go, <laughs> yeah, brush it off. Brush it off. Brush it off. Whatever they post on online about me, blogs about me, I just brush it off. Brush it off. Back then, you type my name, you didn't find anything. Now you type my name, it's like the first 20 pages somewhere, you know? I just fill up all over it. So I, I brush it off, see? You know why? I'm enjoying my life as a celebrity. Yeah, and then those guys can get mad and jealous, you know, and they'll try to pick, uh, piggyback from my name, you know? Oh, you're just so proud and arrogant. I'm just enjoying my celebrity life. Why don't you, huh? Why don't you start, stop being jealous? Why don't you stop being uh, covetous about other things when God has given you something that you should bask in the popularity and the celebrity and the fame and the possession and the inheritance because there's no greater fame, no greater riches than what God has given to you. It's not about being a TV status, a YouTube status. It's not about being the best preacher in the world. It's a matter of being the best in God's eyes Amen. and start to enjoy it now. My fourth point is derision in the wilderness. Derision in the wilderness. Now look at verse 7. <clears throat> look at verse 7. And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because why? Because of the chiding of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now look at verse 2. Verse 2. <clears throat> Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? The start of all whining is because you deride the Lord. You chide the Lord, doubting his care on your life. Moses says, why do you tempt the Lord? Start of all whining is when you deride him by not believing his drink. 
for winners is truly that much of a blessing. You don't believe it. You don't. You really don't. The preacher has preached it so many times. You read it at the Bible so many times. Uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart so many times. Brethren in the room have told you so many times with their lives testimony, and they lived longer years than you did. I mean, you just got the proof over and over again, but you just don't believe that his drink for winners is truly a blessing, and that's your problem. That's the start of all whining, you got to understand. The start of all whining is when you have that serpent in the garden ask you a question. Yea, hath God said all things work together for good? Yea, hath God said my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus? Yea, God is good all the time. Yea, what you're going through is better than anything else. What God has given to you is better than anything else. Yea, is the world not that much better than what heaven can offer. Yeah, yeah. You know, see, that's what the, the devil does is to put that doubt in your mind. And because you let allowed, you allowed that seed to run in your mind. That's why whining eventually comes out. Whining is an affirmation that God is not good. Before whining is doubt, though. And that's where you need to stop it. That's where you need to stop it. To help our unbelief. That's why it's so important that you got to pray. Have you ever prayed to the Lord? Lord, help thou my unbelief. I'll tell you, several people did in the Bible. There were several people in the Bible that said, Lord, I believe, I believe. Yet their flesh didn't. And they said, that's why they cried out, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That's what you need to do. You need to go on your knees and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe, Romans 8, 28. Will you help thou, help thou my unbelief, O Father? Lord, I believe that what you've given to me is better than everything else and what I can go through, what my flesh would want in life. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe that this trial and this suffering is definitely worth it. Will you help thou mine unbelief? That's why you need to pray. That's why you need to quote memorized verses. <clears throat> When's the last time you quoted a verse of promise? Seriously. Ask yourself this question. When's the last time you quoted a verse of promise? A verse of promise. It's been a long time, hasn't it? No wonder you whine. You need, that's why you need to increase your faith by quoting that verse. And, and don't just quote the verse. Believe every word in that verse as you quote it. And if you can't believe that certain word, rewind and quote the verse all over again. Quote the verses for God. Remind yourself of what he did. Did you remember and recall what God saved you from? Do you remember and recall that God chose you out of so many others he could have chosen for this particular path that he brought you in? Do you remember the prayers that God has mightily answered when he has not answered anybody else's like that? Amen. Do you remember the time when God's grace pulled you through and gave you that victory? Do you remember that blessing that he gave to you that you're still enjoying now? Or have you soon forgotten about that blessing and now you're not enjoying the blessing that God has given to you? And I mean not just spiritually, I mean physically too. Physically too. It could be house, money, cars, people in your life, whatever God has given to you. What? You're not living a winner's life. You're not winning in them. You're not winning in them. You're not reminding yourself of how good God was how good God was to you to provide you that physical blessing, that spiritual blessing that you thought you wouldn't get and you got. And now you soon forgot about it. Compare your situations with others. Believe that he is so good to you. You can believe and stop whining when you start to compare yourself with other people. And then you realize, you know what? My life is not really that bad. And if those people pull through and God bless them in the end, why can't he do with me? Compare yourself with other Christians back in history and even today and people in this room even, you'd be surprised. Start doing that and then you can start believing in his power and in his promise. You know what helped me many times? I, I just remember how God pulled through some brothers and sisters in Christ in this room and how God provided the miracle that I thought was impossible and then the Lord provided and we thought it was impossible. And when I look at those things in their lives and I compare myself with theirs, then it helps me to stop 
whining about problems in which I mistakenly think, oh, I'm the greatest person who suffers the most out of everything. And you start whining and you get into that fantastical, unrealistic mode. Start comparing yourself with others. And not only that, rebuke yourself for being weak-minded to correct God's betterment plan that is always a hundred steps ahead of you. And you will shut up whining after that. You will start believing in God. I always try to predict. I always do that. I play mind games with the Lord and try to predict the situation. What would turn out better? And then God, God would show me, well, if you think that would turn out better, don't you think that this bad thing could happen? I go, yeah, it could, you know. And then I say, well, what about this better thing? And God said, well, don't you think that bad thing could happen? And I, could, and I go, yeah, it, that bad thing could happen. And then my mind, in my flesh, I try to plan out what's better for me. And God would show me all the time, well, don't you think that bad thing could happen? Maybe it could get worse with this one. It could get worse than that one. And you know what happens? Then I finally get sick and tired of trying to think of what's better for me. And then now my flesh finally gave up thinking what's better for me and start to learn to lean on the everlasting arms and not think anymore what's better for me and say, God, you take care of everything. I don't care what happens. Just do it. You're, you're always better. Amen. Rebuke yourself for being so pathetic and weak-minded to that omniscient, infinite mind of God who knows how to turn out the hundred trials in, into your life into a tenfold blessing even more. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. Deuteronomy 32. And then we will close with this last passage here. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Man, you know, don't you want to win? Don't you want your church to be the greatest? Don't you want to be the greatest Christian who ever lived? Don't you want to be, don't you want to win every temptation and trial? Don't you want to win all the blessings of the Lord? Don't you want to be the top 10 or the top 100 or the top 1,000 people at the judgment seat of Christ? Don't you want to win? You want to win. Then stop whining. Finish whining. Go ahead, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 15. But Jeshurun wax fat. And kick, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. See, that's you, like the children of Israel, Jeshurun. You wax fat, you are growing, you are winning, you are winning. Then he forsook God which made him. And look at this, what does it say? Lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. God gave you that drink from that rock, Jesus Christ. Like the children of Israel who drank that water from the rock in the wilderness. And you know what? You lightly esteemed that. You lightly esteemed that winner's life. That rock of your salvation that God has given to you. And then what happened? Look at verse 18. Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful. Aren't you? And hast forgotten God. Right? You did. That formed thee. Look at verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, oh, God forbid, God forbid, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. God, I don't like this Bible-believing life that I'm living in. I lightly esteem it. You whine about that? Then God will answer your prayer. He'll take it away from you. God, I don't like the money that I'm earning right here. God will take it from you. God, I don't like this job. I don't like this school that I'm going through. God will take it away from you. God, I don't like this family member and this loved one, this friend that's doing this and that. And that. God will take them away from you. God can split your family apart, have your children run away from home. You can go through a divorce, or God can even take one of them home to heaven so that you can, at the funeral, finally remember the good things that they were to you in your life, and you can't take them back anymore. <clears throat> you whine about what you want. You whine about this church. You whine about the life God has given to you. You whine about your living situation. Then God will take it away from you. He will answer your desire. He will grant your wish and answer your prayer. He'll take it away from you. Be careful what you say. God will take those things away from you so that your flesh, your wicked, stubborn, arrogant flesh can finally feel what it's like to be grateful. 
complain about, whine about the food. Wait till the food's taken away from you. And your flesh will learn, feel the gratitude of what it's like to eat. You know one thing I learned in my life? When God takes away something, I finally learn what it's like to be grateful after I lose something. And that's what God's going to do in your life. Do you want God to do that? Do you want God to take away this church? Do you want God to take away your money? Do you want God to take away your family? Do you, want to, do you want God to take away that spiritual blessing or whatever physical blessing you've got? Do you want God to take those things away then? Then stop whining about them and win. You won them. God given them to you. Now enjoy them. Amen. Remember, you're that Christian who was running the race. And man, you ran so hard and you ran on top of hills. You ran, on, you ran through the rough roads. And then there were those broad, comfortable paths that billions were falling into. But then you walked the straight and narrow path. And you went in through that narrow gate. And remember, you sweated and you, you ran and you ran and you panted. And then remember that you were going through this satanic attack and this particular suffering and that particular trial God has put you through and remember those days when you ran through and you passed them you overcame them and you crossed that finish line and as you cross that finish line you finally won you finally won and God gave you that crown and you won that million dollar prize and here's the judge named Jesus Christ, he finally gave it in your hands and put it on your lap and says, now live like a winner. Now enjoy them. Raise your head high and show off to the whole world how good God was to you. And start enjoying the prize. But you know what happened? Then Satan, the loser who lost the battle and who, who pulled and tempted you and tried you and you pulled through who tried to damn your soul to hell, but then you pulled through. And Satan, he lost these attacks here, and you didn't quit Christianity yet. Now that loser, he sees that prize that you're holding. The cities you're about to rule on this earth. The gold and silver that's laid up for you in heaven. The crowns that are building up to number five. And then the inheritance of all things, whatever that was. Satan sees that right now in your bank in heaven. You won. You got it. And now Satan the loser, he tricked you by saying, isn't God not good? Man, you, that, I mean, look at, uh, look, at, look at the pleasures of this world. Isn't that so much better? You know, God could have done a little bit more fairly right here. And, you know, it's not really that much worth it after all, is it? You know, I mean, look at that problem you're going through right now and that, that particular trial you're going through and there's no hope for you. I mean, I mean, you're losing. You're losing. You're losing. You won. You won. You got it up in heaven. You're winning. You won. But Satan, he wants to trick you because he wants your prize money. He doesn't want you to rule the cities that he wants to rule. He doesn't want you to get the gold, silver, and precious stones that he wanted. He doesn't want you to enjoy heaven when he tried with all his might. He didn't want you to enjoy all that. And then here you are holding, look, look at this. You're holding the crown. You're holding the crown. And then pretty soon now you're going like this. And you're dropping it. And you're getting more depressed. And you start whining and then you start crying. <laughs> and then... The devil's like, that's right, that's right. Here you are with that crown, and then crown number five drops. He got it. And then he ran away with that crown. And here you are, still snoveling in your seat, Sunday morning today, crying and whining about, I lost. Why don't you run down on the altar, grab the crown back from the devil, and raise it up like a winner. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Finish whining and start winning. Why don't you finish whining and start winning? You're, you're on the winning side. 
You're on the winning side. Enough. Enough crying. Enough whining. The Lord has given you the victory. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. This is the faith that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory. Some of you perhaps don't know what it's like to win. You're probably not in the winning life. Perhaps you're lost in sin and, you know, maybe you're not saved. You don't know what it's like to taste the winner's life. Let me ask you a simple question. Please be honest. Please be honest. If you're to die right now, right now, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You might say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. Well, guess what? Why don't you make sure right now? You can get saved right now. It's so easy to get saved. You might say, well, Pastor, how do I get saved? Three easy steps. Three easy steps. First step, you got to realize that you've sinned. And God has to punish your sin with hell fire. So the first point is, you got to understand, you can't go to heaven because you've sinned. And you, gotta, and you might go, well, pastor, well, what do I do then? Good, you're already at number two then, number two. <clears throat> number two, you know the story that Jesus is God, he is God, and he died, buried, and resurrected. Now, you, you might say, well, pastor, what's so important about that story? You know why? His blood washes away every sin you've done. Remember, your sin is the reason why you're going to hell. So the only thing that can wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> you might say, wow, that's great. I believe it, Pastor. Great. Then you're already at number three. Number three, if you believe that blood of Jesus can take you to heaven, all you have to do, all you have to do is say to God, say to God, God, I repent as a sinner, so I'm only going to believe in the blood to save me. That's it. It's that simple. See, we're done. Number three. You might say, well, pastor, I want to do that. I want to get saved. Good. I can help you out. I'll give you the words on how to say it to God. You can tell him right now, God, I repent as a sinner and believe in the blood to save me. I can give you the words to say it to God. And don't worry, every head is bowed, every eye is shut. No one knows who you are. I'm not going to point you out. I'm going to give you these words, and all you have to do is repeat after me. Now, don't worry. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it silently to yourself, okay? You can say it silently to yourself, and no one will point you out. But remember this. When you repeat these words after me, repeating a prayer does not save you. What saves you is when you say to God, I believe in the blood to save me. That's what saves you. I'm just giving you the words on how to say it. That's it, okay? That's all. So I'm going to give you the words. Repeat after me. Now believe it. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. So his blood can wash away my sin. So I only believe in the blood to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would keep your head bow and eyes shut one last time, one last time, and then we're done. This will be very quick. This will be very quick. <clears throat> If you just repeated those words after me, could you just slip up your hand real quickly? Now, don't worry. I'm not going to point you out. No one knows whose you are. Every head ba is bowed and every eye shut. If you say, well, preacher, I just repeated those words after you and I got saved, could you just slip up your hand just real quick, just real quick, and we won't point you out? Could you slip it up right now, please, right now? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Heavenly Father, I pray and trust that everyone is saved and blood-bought by Jesus Christ and going to heaven. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that <clears throat> because we've already won that, we're on the winning side, God. I mean, you saved us from hell, man. What better life? Lord, we've won. Help us to live like winners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.